Hello there, thank you for joining me again today on the bench uh, for a look today and uh, do some measurements um, is the bird series of watt meters um, we sort of got a family of uh, bird products here uh, which all uh, demonstrate birds capabilities across the RF measurement range of products that they offer um, so Basically starting on the left, we've got the Bird 43 Watt Meter, which has um, been very popular for many decades now. Um, they've been around many, many years and uh, still widely used across various industries in the RF measurement world. Um, very popular, not only in commercial sectors, but also amateur radio. Lots of radio hams buy them. Um, we've got some other bird accessories here, which is an oil filled, um, I don't know if you can hear that, 50 ohm load uh, that can take about um, 20 watts, I think it is, or something continuous. Uh, then we've got other accessories as well, such as uh, low power uh, RF loads as well. And uh, and then not forgetting, of course, the, the pods. Uh, we'll take one of these apart, I've got one in a bag here that's uh, already apart so we'll have a look inside what these these little pods do uh, then we've got the bird 5000 EX which is a, a digital version of the bird 43 and this does away with a lot of the uh, inadequacies of the bird 43 insofar as not needing any of these inserts um, now bird when they brought these out they did two types of power sensors they did this wideband power sensor uh, but they also did another sensor which looks similar to this except it took these you had to have two of these um, pods these these slugs inserts as they're called which one was in the reverse power uh, mode and the other one was in the forward power and that would then tell the meter what, what was going off but again that restricted its frequency bandwidth depending on what pod insert you had in uh, because as we'll go into a, in a moment these are abandoned and have power ranges so bird moved on to this type of uh, sensor head then uh, which has a USB and RS232 uh, port on the top and the um, being a wideband power sensor can measure up to I think 500 watts RF power up to a 1, one gigahertz in this particular sensor model um, but it opened up the measurement capability as well into a different arena which came around the time these meters were developed which has pulsed uh, transmitters uh, such as radar for example and also digital radio standards such as Tetra, DMR, uh, Fusion, different types of digital modes, um, D-Star, things like that, all these pulse modes, Tetra Pole um, any kind of digital radio transmission where it uses a pulsed carrier this this was designed to be able to measure that so that was a very useful feature um, now as well as that you could drive this particular sensor using software um, on a laptop which I'm going to show you as well a bit later uh, without having it connected to this uh, um, head here which is the display unit and uh, this has many features this display unit which we'll go into when we do actual RF measurements um, we also have the fixed frequency version as well where we had basically DC to 1 gigahertz um, power power meters that they developed and came out with uh, this particular one is a um, can handle I think up to uh, can't read that through the camera let's have a look, zoom in, see what spec it says uh, so it's a model, a bird model 61 it can handle 15 and 30 watts so obviously 50 ohms and um, the nice thing about this is that obviously you don't need the the slugs you see, it just works however it's got a limited power range now this meter like the bird 43 detaches from the front of this RF load so this particular device is quite useful for doing sort testing 
on transmitters that are on a long time because of the, the heat sink and also uh, its ability to, to work uh, for prolonged periods of time so it's a very good uh, a good good instrument for that um, and indeed sometimes these were used at broadcast stations for monitoring um, sample RF power for long periods of time or indeed on the reflected um, port on a directional coupler or even a on the reflected port on a circulator so if the antenna VSWR went uh, went high the RF power would be dumped into this and it would read the reflected power from an antenna there which was quite good at uh, very good for like long wave medium wave um, broadcast stations as well as HF stations VHF broadcast stations had them uh, and there were also some other developments in that field as well um, so where they had separate uh, reflectometers which were bird branded which I have um, and they obviously connected to meters that were inset in panels so this meter came out and went in panels in a 19 inch rack so we've got these little lugs here that uh, you just flick them up uh, one on each side and then the meter detaches from the front and then we've got the um, little cable that coils up inside and we can move this meter then to wherever we want it and uh, and then we've got the reflectometer there the um, power bridge and uh, we can obviously check we've got these little inserts that come in and out as well which which change its power level readings um, and then obviously a big nice heat sink with a, a carry handle as well for ease of, ease of use um, so that was a nice little meet. I've had that a number of years it's always been very useful um, and then we had other things as well that uh, Bird developed and brought out not only did we have the standard loads you know RF loads etc that you know you commonly see that are, are long oblong RF loads which I shall show shortly but you also had the the really good stuff that uh, was obviously oil filled uh, work up to one gigahertz quite high power levels and these were the type of, of loads that you could use for long periods of time on sort of testing of radio transmitters etc because a lot of um, people don't realize that when you're doing transmit measurements um, it's not just a short duration as well sometimes these meters are used in applications where they are used for very long periods of time in a, in a transmit measurement so therefore they need to be able to dissipate that RF power a small RF load such as this one uh, which is a, a ray call uh, RF load which is connected on here is only suitable for measuring RF power for a limited amount of time before it would overheat and burn out so you know the, the, there was a lot of thought went into the design with the bird instruments as to you know the, the capabilities that they were designed for which was for prolonged use um, as well so that's one of the reasons why that I think they became so popular now there was another manufacturer that made a meter very similar looking to the Bird 43 and uh, it did have a slight advantage actually over Bird 43 and I had one many years ago and unfortunately I sold it and I wish I never had done because I've not been able to acquire one since but it was a, a meter called the Telewave meter now Telewave I'm not sure if they're somehow affiliated with Bird or something like that, but it was a very similar design to that meter, it almost looked identical, except it had two black rotary switches here. Uh, one was for measuring forward and reflect power, and the other had steps from 5 watts, I think, up to 150 watts. And if I get a picture of it um, off the internet, I'll show you what it is. But the nice thing about that was, is that essentially, it was a little like, bit like this meter in, in, in the fact that you didn't need these slugs, these inserts, you see, in order to make it work on different frequencies. And so therefore, you just bought that meter and it came in two models. The first model went up to UHF, about 400 megahertz. And the second model went right up to 1 gigahertz. So it meant that if you're lucky enough to have that model, which I had originally, but then I didn't use it much so I sold it um, meant that then you didn't need to buy all these slugs 
and these slugs are quite expensive you know depending on what RF power level you're going for uh, and what frequency ranges there are particular slugs which are extremely expensive particularly the HF uh, frequency um, bands and powers that <coughs> they do tend to get a little bit uh, expensive uh, but then so do they on other frequencies as well um, so you've got to be careful with the purchasing of these meters because when you weigh it up sometimes to purchase one of these meters on its own with all the slugs that go in it inserts for measuring the different frequency bands and RF power levels it can get out of control because you can end up paying more uh, to buy all the inserts along with the meter than you can if you wanted to purchase something like this which does exactly the same um, it's more more refined and it also has better calibration and you can measure digital transmitters as well um, and obviously sideband transmitters too the bird 43 did have some accessories that you could purchase to modify the bird so that it could um, measure peak envelope power on AM and SSB transmitters uh, and it would average it out and it would measure the peak and you modified the meter, it came with like a little mod kit and there was a switch and it was powered with a battery and it had a little circuit board inside that you had to fit and calibrate it so that it could measure, um, you know, it could measure quick um, and, and quickly read the, the RF envelope. So these were really designed for uh, CW or FM transmitters, AM a little bit but Generally speaking, they were they were manufactured for uh, carrier wave applications. Um, they can measure pulse power, and you can see it. Um, you know, if you put on a, a digital transmitter, but it won't measure the peak power. It'll only measure the average if it, depending on how quickly it can catch up. So they weren't really designed for digital modes, whereas these were designed for analog as well as digital modes. The Bird 5000 EX model and uh, indeed these were also um, useful because they also came with a, it was like a pod that had a helical aerial um, on it and I had one of those and got rid of it which I wish I'd never had done but it was basically a look like that it was it was like an insert with an antenna on it it had a BNC here uh, on the on the front of the insert and it took a battery inside and basically it was a field strength meter insert which then plugged into the Bird 43 <coughs> and gave it its um, capability of measuring field strength um, with a near field within um, close proximity to a transmitter source or an antenna. So uh, you could get various different accessories with it. Um, obviously, those carry cases, accessories, um, and then in the sides you had a little uh, hole cut out in the side so that you could you know keep your inserts safe you know you could carry a couple of inserts inside the um, the, the unit so that you know you didn't have to carry it with a case so in, in effect you could have three inserts one in the um, reflectometer and the others in the in the holes on the sides and um, basically the, the way that these operated, for those that don't know, and there'll be many that do, is as you can see there's an arrow on the pod and um, when you've selected the right frequency band for the pod and the power level that you're wanting to read, um, if you're measuring um, via the arrow symbology here, you connect your transmitter on this port here on the left and your antenna or your load on this side and then while it's in that direction measuring RF power going from left to right then you would read read the uh, power on the scale to measure reflected power that was coming back from say an antenna you would simply turn that so that the arrow will be facing the opposite direction so any RF power coming back to the transmitter from the right as in an antenna would then pass through the um, insert and then be read as reflected power on there. So basically all you did was just turn this from reflector forward power etc backwards and forwards. And um, they were they were reasonably, reasonably priced um, 
you know when they first came out these meters but as the cult following and they become more popular uh, as years have gone on particularly if they're in good condition and they come with a, a leather carry um, handle a leather carry case as well there's a, not only have you got the carry handle on the top but you've also got a, a leather carry case that you can buy and I've had those and then in the top of the leather carry case there's a, a little compartment where all these they keep up to ten of these pods these inserts in the in the box with it and all the leads and things like that that come with it um, but there's no batteries in them or anything they're quite easy to look after and maintain uh, you don't have to have the end types um, the type N um, socket on the end here um, these covers are stuck on for some reason, I don't know why, but uh, I'll have to see if I can get those off. You can buy different um, sockets that go on the sides, so obviously you know you can put BNCs on SMAs, you can do whatever you want, you can put TNCs on, you know you can buy the, the different things and then just push fit, um, so there's no soldering or messing about or anything like that. But a very nice meter indeed, you know, obviously been around many decades. I do prefer the Telewave though to this because at least you've got a, a power selection and forward and reflect and it's calibrated from DC up to 1 GHz and you don't need all these all these pods. Um, I think though that the Bird 43 is more accurate because obviously of these little inserts and the power ranges um, and that's obviously what gives it an edge over say the Telewave but um, generally speaking it's uh, it's good enough you know so again these these pods are very expensive very in price depending on what power level and uh, frequency range I mean this particular um, sensor here has got 125 uh, sorry 425 to 850 megahertz at one watt um, then we've got like this one 50 watt 2 to 30 megahertz for HF band um, that's a 25 watt 125 50 to 125 megs so you know and then there's these as well 100 to 250 megs 50 watt all sorts of different ones you know and there are different manufacturers as well um, that I think got in on the game that were affiliated with uh, with Bird as well I mean this being a, a, an example where I've got the cover off to show you what's inside the bird insert um, who was this one made by let's have a look so I think it's Quaxel Dynamics or something yeah Quaxel Dynamics so that's what's inside the uh, insert with this cap that goes over there protected when that's removed so if we, if we just have a look at that um, so what you can see there is we've got what is the pickup um, which is obviously on the this section here plus as well this little transformer RF ballon thing um, which if I can get it focused connects to a diode which as you can just see there so that's this is the diode down there and uh, that goes off to uh, one of these contacts on the side that makes contact with the the meter movement so if I can just uh, get it to focus in on that it's pretty bad at focusing is this camera so a lot so that's the diode there on the right that's just going in and uh, that connects to one side of that uh, transformer pickup and then on the other side there we've got it going directly down into the ground side of the um, pod so once this plate here is for measuring reflected or forward whichever and then the other underneath is for doing the same um, for picking up and there's some kind of like a capacitor formed with this insulating mat that they've used around it this grey stuff so 
yeah quite weird so that's what's inside one and then on the sides there look we've got these contacts which you can see contact there and then when you turn it around another contact there and that's so that um, it can make contact with what's inside here so that's the transmission line that goes through the inside down there that bar and then you've got the contacts on the inside which you can just see there that make contact with the with the insert when it's uh, it's obviously rotated now for the scales on these you can get them that read up to you know a thousand watts uh, easy uh, so you can get pods inserts that go in there that that can go right up to a kilowatt and then obviously use the appropriate scale um, so there's like three scales so for example if you've got like a one watt pod then you'd use a bottom scale um, so that will be you know uh, zero milliwatts um, 200 milliwatts 400 600 800 milliwatts at one watt you know if it was a 10 watt pod that'd be two watts four watts six eight ten ten watts uh, if it's a hundred watts obviously 20 40 60 80 100 watts if it was a 50 watt pod then you'd be using the second scale so that naturally it would read up to 50 watts if it was a 5 watt pod again you'd be using the second scale um, if it was say a, um, uh, obviously a higher powered insert that was put in then you would just use the scale as a multiplier and, and therefore it would read that you've got a zero set as well so you can uh, you can alter the needle as well with the little screw here the set screw to alter the uh, needle onto the zero to calibrate it um, it's not like the Evo 8 uh, ammeters where you've got a mirror behind the, um, the glass on the on the bezel where you can see the reflection of the needle and thus calibrate it exactly but you can more or less get it right you know when you look at it face on if you lay it on its back it's designed with the um, feet on the back anyway so that you can lay it, lay it down and obviously then look straight down at the meat uh, needle and then adjust this for the correct uh, calibration um, so yeah nice nice meters they've been around a very long time they're still popular even today obviously as time goes on I think they'll get less popular particularly in the commercial world um, or military world because the um, armies across the world um, use these as well for their communication systems but with digital modes uh, that are, are widely used at the moment and uh, pulsed applications on transmitters these will I think just naturally come out of fashion as time goes on and probably um, find other uses in other market areas so that's the uh, the bird 43 uh, body the pods as I say all different powers different RF levels um, different uh, prices as well wildly you tend to find that the uh, pods that are on ridiculous frequencies that are like in the cellular band because the um, mobile phone manufacturers um, for the base stations manufactured the um, base station transceivers <coughs> that go on hilltop radio sites and, uh, and cell towers and uh, when they're doing measurements they have a, a mode that they can select a test mode on their transceivers that put it into CW mode and then they can adjust the RF power um, and do calibrations and measurements so you do tend to find there's quite a lot of these that have gone back onto the surplus market now uh, particularly with the advent of 4G, 5G etc where the frequency bands are um, you know are, are using different transmission modes etc that where these are, are less popular now these uh, pods on those frequencies so you can get them really cheap on some of the higher frequencies that uh, obviously no good unless you're using equipment on those frequencies but you tend to find the cellular band stuff uh, for these the, the inserts are quite cheap however the um, HF um, inserts that go in them for 2 to 30 megs etc are very expensive and certain RF power levels 
and certain frequency bands are very expensive ridiculously expensive some of them um, and you've got to really be careful with them as well because if you drop them on the floor and they impact something hard this plastic can break quite easily it can damage the insert very easily if you're not careful and you can end up breaking them um, when they do fail as well internally there have been people that have done repairs where they've drilled out this little rivet at the end of the arrow there there's a little rivet you can just see they'll drill that out take this disc off this cover which exposes uh, the internal um, components uh, because when they are dropped sometimes they become detached internally and so basically this is one that's uh, I repaired years ago um, and then once you've got that disc off and I do have replacement discs as well but um, once you get that disc off and you get the screw out and then that gives you access to the internal parts of the uh, of the sensor obviously to do repairs and there are plenty of articles on the internet on how to repair them when they're broken but uh, you do have to be careful with them you know they're not uh, something to be knocked about thrown about um, parts are still available for them um, you still get meter movements and uh, the reflectometer that goes in there you can get the different connectors that go on the side and uh, people do paint them you know when they sometimes they're in terrible condition the outsides of them um, and they do need looking after in, in that sense you know where the carry handle breaks the leather deteriorates and goes all bad so that's a little rundown on the uh, bird 43 um, and we'll use that with the uh, ham radio transceiver we've got here which is an all mode all band uh, transceiver from basically DC right up to UHF so we'll do some measurements soon with that and uh, we'll have a look at the uh, bird 5000DX digital one now Just before we put the Bird 5000DX on, I just wanted to demonstrate the Bird 43 working with the HF radio transceiver. So we've got this uh, radio transceiver set to uh, 7 MHz. The pod that's in the meter there is a 50 watt pod that goes from 2 to 30 megs. So we can select different frequencies uh, right the way down there, 28 megs. So it should be fairly uniform. Put it on 10 MHz for example, 10 megs dead. I'm going to change the uh, RF power, we, we can transmit to FM, AM, CW, LSB, USB, obviously SSB transmission, so just make sure that uh, we've got it on uh, on FM for the time being. Uh, we'll just put the transmitter on. This is a 15 watt load and a 50 watt pod, so I don't want to damage the load. I'll turn the RF power up to, uh, as if it wants to turn the RF power on, 10 megahertz RF power, it should be, uh, should be coming, oh I know why, like an idiot, got to turn that the right way around haven't we, see, schoolboy error, right now we can turn that up, 15 watts RF power on the 50 watt scale, so that's uh, bang in the middle roughly, Right, so now that we've done that, uh, we can establish what it's like on uh, sideband. So if we hit the SSB key, and we're on, is that lower sideband or upper sideband? I can't see the, the display. Upper sideband, we're on USB. Okay, so if I uh, talk into the microphone, one, two, three, four, five, general speech, it's not really giving much of an indication, but if I hollow into the, or whistle, Five, five, one, two, three, four, five, five. So we had it at 15 watts on FM. It should be reaching that on sidebands, but it's moving too quick for the meter to register with just standard speech. So if I could whistle, we're getting more power on a whistle. And on a five, one, two, one, two, five. So if we're modulating it with a a steady tone which that's what you'd use anyway into the microphone here a sig gen 
generating a one kilohertz or whatever into that and then you'll be able to read the power on there um, but that's one of the reasons why um, they do the mod for the AM as well because on, on AM let's have a look here AM that's FM and that's AM so on AM for example if we wanted to read the peak envelope power on transmit we're getting 60% RF power obviously uh, roughly and then when I talk into the microphone when they're getting tiny little changes you can just see the needle moving so for reading AM uh, that's one of the reasons why you get that modification that little board that plugs in with the switch so you can measure your peak envelope power as well uh, but obviously on FM um, FM mode on transmit it's going straight to 15 watts no problem and um, so that's that but yeah I mean they're obviously uh, still capable of reading power on SSB AM not so much but on SSB and um, naturally on um, you know FM they're, they're, they're fine no problem at all so they're still really good for measuring sidebands in particular um, unless you want to modify it obviously and you buy that mod kit and then you know it'll measure them all and, um, so that's that example of forward RF power now obviously we're into a 50 ohm load here if I were to reverse the path now so I'm measuring any reflected power then naturally when I key up I don't expect to see any RF power coming back because this should be absorbing all that power now if I were to disconnect this uh, RF load uh, to represent a fault in a transmission line or a defective antenna that kind of a scenario and we were using it in that capability where we had a coax going off to an aerial and it was suspected faulty then when I key up you see we're getting a lot of power coming back so that's RF power that's reached the port can't go anywhere and it has to go back to the source which is a transmitter naturally if that happened all over a prolonged period of time particularly while you're transmitting it would damage the uh, power amplifier section in the radio and destroy it and that would mean an expensive repair for the radio, any radio transceiver, it doesn't matter but uh, particularly in uh, cases where you're doing broadcast uh, transmitters for example that are broadcasting at very high RF power levels kilowatts, hundreds of watts, many hundreds of thousands of watts, megawatts you know broadcast stations um, just slight problems with the antenna or coaxial feeder can mean massive reflections in RF power which can cause uh, issues uh, and so that's one of the reasons why broadcast transmitters in particular or uh, repeater stations in PMR radio systems use circulators or isolators so that any RF power coming back from the antenna is uh, fed into the circulator and there is um, three ports on it, one for the load which is the antenna um, a second port which is the, the reflected port which is what you connect an RF load to and then the other port is your transmitter so it allows power to go through the circulator to the antenna but should the antenna become faulty the coaxial cable become defective which can often be the case on radio towers you know connectors can let water in in rainstorms and things like that or icy conditions can crack the sleeving of the coaxial cable and uh, extremes of high temperature in the summer months well has an impact on coaxial feeders and uh, wave guys etc and coaxial cables all suffer from moisture ingress or water ingress at some point and that then could increase the VSWR reflections at how much RF power is coming back to the transmitter so in cases where you're using a, a repeater for example or a, um, a hilltop radio master transceiver or for example a um, broadcast transmitter it's in your interest to try and prevent RF from coming back to the transmitter should a fault condition occur and that's why you get the circulator and its job is to allow RF power to pass from the transmitter to the antenna but not allow RF power to come back to the transmitter if any RF power comes back it mainly shoves it out on another port which connects to a, a, a 50 ohm load to dissipate the RF power that's coming back so that's where you protect your transmitters 
Um, but it's never advisable to run an open circuit into a transmitter while it's transmitting because you cause damage, um, particularly on long overs, etc. So that's a little rundown of the Bird 43. Just forgot to mention with the Bird 43, although we looked earlier at the bottom of the uh, the pod, which is covered with this uh, little white protective cover, um, I've got one apart, which is one that I repaired years ago, hence the reason why it hasn't got the disc there, but um, on that side, obviously, um, we had a look at earlier, but this is the what's in the top bit, uh, and that's how you calibrate them as well, this little potentiometer that's just here. You'd obviously insert the slug and the calibration procedure for these is um, depending on what model they are obviously um, of RF power uh, what it can read I'm not even sure if that's what it is there but I don't think it is but um, I think it's written on it somewhere what power it is I think it's a 50 watt this one or 100 watt whatever but basically when you've got it in you would calibrate this potentiometer to read the right RF level with a calibrated RF source um, so you know that's what you would do in my case I'd use the um, Calmus uh, calibrated RF amp source and uh, which I've got down here so this is a particular calibration example uh, I would use the this particular thing which goes from 0.5 to a gigahertz and um, it produces six watts of RF power so that is a calibrated we would use that in conjunction with the uh, you know the test gear to produce a given RF level at a given frequency and then we would output that then into the bird 43 we would put the pod, pod in and then naturally after any repairs or whatever that's been done to the pod then we would calibrate that potentiometer then to give the correct uh, correct RF levels and um, that's how we would deal with that so that's how you would calibrate such an instrument using these calibrated uh, RF power amplifiers uh, that I have a number of, of these but uh, different power levels as well. This only does 6 watts, but I've got some that do, you know, 75, 100 watts uh, that are much, much bigger. Um, but again, these are designed not to change RF level with time, um, providing they're kept at a constant temperature, fan cold, etc., then the RF power is very, very stable on them. So that's how you can calibrate these at the different frequencies. Um, so that's a little rundown of the, the Bird 43. Um, RF power meter and its uh, its use in different applications. Great tool for hilltop top radio sites. You know, take them anywhere. Uh, use them in vehicles when you're doing vehicle installations and you're drilling the roof of a vehicle uh, to mount a, an M8 antenna or whatever, or um, you, you're cutting whips on uh, antennas on vehicles. Uh, to calibrate the VSWL reflected power to trim the, the whips so that you get less RF coming back or trace any faults in a vehicle because it's a nice little portable instrument, you don't need batteries for it um, Iltop radio towers, again, very very useful up there for talk through base stations and BTSs um, and old radios and naturally um, not only mobiles and base stations but also home station or um, broadcast sites you can use them there and the pods go up to ridiculous RF power levels as well you can get them where the, the kilowatts and um, for all frequencies right up to you know two three gigahertz I think I've certainly seen some at 2400 megs and 1800 megs as well pods that go in there so you know you could uh, get if you get a 23 sems amateur band uh, pod that goes in there they're quite rare to get hold of but you can have these on basically um, every amateur radio band that is possible as well as commercial so you know you can collect them over time and that's what people generally do with these they, they collect these slugs over time because they do cost money and um, add them to the collection and then obviously you know you can uh, you can build up your your arsenal over time um, so right okay we'll have a look at the 5000DX finally Okay, we've got the Bird 5000DX, connected it up to the 
wideband sensor and uh, we'll switch it on now these meters uh, some although they're great don't get me wrong the way that they were designed they're a bit of a pain in the backside because you can get this lead wrong here the RS232 meter leads are the same nine way gender and uh, you can actually plug in which is a common thing that people do by mistake on top of the meter they can plug in the meter lead into the RS232 and then drive themselves around the twist trying to work out why it won't talk to the sensor head also when you switch off the unit to turn it off the sensor head remains powered on um, eventually it does go off but it's weird that I've never understood why that happens but anyway it's, it seems to be the case with them all um, on the display though when you turn it on it's quite self-explanatory how it works but basically you can set up uh, your forward units and your reflected units um, as well in different either BSWR uh, obviously return loss DBM microwatts uh, Rio as well so you've got the different units there but in order to get it to read correctly and this is the pain in the backside bit and it's sort of it miss really with these things you're meant to have a 50 ohm load connected to the output on the uh, wideband sensor and then what it's meant to do then we press the zero button and it's purely it misses this with these where you get, you get issues with them where they will um, fail sometimes the self cal but then you run it again it'll pass and you've done nothing it's just weird that's all how it how it works it's a very strange piece of equipment um, I don't think they've really thought it out to be honest with the design I think they sort of tried to rush them out before they could uh, perfect certain things that, that were happening on them um, they're a bit quirky shall we say but anyway it should pass hopefully touch wood you know let's see it's getting to the end of its uh, cal routine so we'll see whether it passes or fails uh, there can be a bit of a pain for that but uh, if you do get one of these and it fails then just run it again see it says fail there I knew it was going to do that if you press uh, I think it's escape zero again and then it'll pass it's just weird um, why they designed it that way I don't know but it's very very strange and uh, they are susceptible to noise as well on the RF side so if you've got them connected to an antenna or a transceiver and then something noises on their RF noise coming through it can disturb the measurement uh, as it's trying to calibrate so it's always best trying to calibrate while the uh, the meters connected to a 50 ohm load to suppress any uh, transients that might be picked up by the the, end, the type N sockets hey yeah, I see it's passed you know it's just software glitches things like that so you know just one of those things so right we're ready to do a, a measurement now um, obviously with these you can connect the sense head directly to software which I'm going to demonstrate as well by USB and there's a piece of bird software that runs on the uh, on the radio um, software for the the power meter or you can use this power meter which we're going to do in conjunction with this transceiver so bear with me okay we've got the uh, bird 5000 sensor now connected directly to the um, laptop and we're running the VPM um, software on it which is the virtual power meter software now if you do get one of these uh, meters um, with the head thing you might get with it um, the CD-ROM that comes with it because these obviously were produced in the days when CD-ROMs were obviously quite big now the problem with the uh, software that you'll find is that particularly modern day uh, devices such as tablets that have singular USB ports on them or um, modern PCs that have got Windows 10 sort of uh, level on them OS you'll get problems with the COM port because this was this product was designed in the days when uh, COM ports were configured um, in the control panel device manager now although that still exists today in Windows 10 you can go into ports and COM etc and set COM ports up what you'll find with devices that have got touch screens on them uh, the device itself uses the touch screen COM port 
uh, it's a com one um, for the mouse etc by touching the screen and that conflicts with the com port that this software uses so when you plug in a USB device into the um, side of the machine or whatever if it's a single port one for example what it will do then Microsoft will try and set up a device driver for this now, it won't find it because obviously it's a specific product being a bird power sensor so what it does it sets up a generic COM port now that COM port can become 6 it can become 8 it can become 12 whatever it'll give it a generic COM port and the problem with that is the software will only talk from COM1 to COM4 now obviously COM1 on most tablet devices is generally used for the touch screen and the mouse uh, com2 can be as well you know one driver can be for the touch screen the other can be then for the uh, trackpad etc so you can lose com1 and 2 straight away comes 3 and 4 might not even be on the machine so naturally then even if you're selecting the software here com3 and 4 it won't communicate with the sensor so what you're going to get unfortunately with birds software i don't know why it's always the case with bird stuff but you do get problems and um, it can lead you astray or in all different ways um, so the best thing to do I've found is to uh, try and get into the settings in the COM ports and the USB serial bus controllers and try and manually set up your COM port so that basically um, when it recognises the connection from the bird sensor that it will put it onto say COM2 or COM1 now obviously on devices that can be a bit tricky it can conflict with the touch screen or the mouse and it can cause conflicts because the microsoft driver is trying to then conflict with the bird software driver for the com port so you might have to do a little bit of um, um, manipulation with the com ports to try and jiggle things about a little bit so that you move the com port for the touch screen and the mouse onto some other port so that it doesn't conflict with com one and two which the software likes to use. Now on this particular machine this is quite an old laptop uh, this is sort of uh, Windows 7 era that kind of thing. Now the VPM software that comes on the CD-ROM only needs Windows XP to run it but then it does need prerequisites such as .NET Framework uh, one or two other prerequisites as well that have to be downloaded from the internet so you'd have to make sure if you did download or install that CD-ROM onto an older style Pentium machine, for example, that it still has access or network connectivity to the internet to then install the prerequisites because naturally the prerequisites won't already be installed on the laptop. So you sort of try to solve that problem as well by connecting an old laptop then that may not have Wi-Fi, for example, it just has a LAN port on it then to your internet router to then tunnel out to the internet um, so there is that as well to look at but in this context this is a Windows 7 uh, machine and uh, this does connect to the internet so I can download the latest software so this is VPM 203 if I remember rightly from the Bird website and this software um, is designed for Windows 7 service pack 1 upwards now, I don't know why they never produced a piece of software for the for the Apple uh, iMac. It would be much better as well to have had that flexibility and support to Apple products because then at least you could use it with the MacBook, the iMac, um, you know, and you could have been able to use that more graphically um, with the iMac because of its larger screen and flexibility and graphical user interface. It'd be, it would have looked better. But for some reason, Bird stayed with the, the software being um, Microsoft. Um, and that has its own inherent problems, obviously, especially when you're using it with what are USB ports, um, serial ports, things like that. I'm trying to set the serial aspect up. On the older machines like this, it's easier um, because, obviously, you've got the COM ports available in Device Manager. But on tablet devices, it uses a singular port. USB um, then it can cause problems obviously and then you have to perhaps use an external dock to expand the COM ports and then try and allocate a spare port on the dock then to one of the COM ports that the software can can use so it's six or one and a half dozen of the other uh, you get good luck with one part of it and bad luck with the other part you know and it can drive you up the wall um, 
so yeah we've downloaded the software we've got it running uh, when you first run the software it'll scan for the ports if it if it sees that the ports got the connection to it from the sensor then it will connect to it automatically you don't have to manually configure it um, and then it will set the comport up automatically and grab it and then obviously talk to it so on the software um, we've got it connected to the uh, radio transceiver now if I, uh, we're in measurement mode at the moment, um, so as you can see there it's reading 15 watts when I'm transmitting and we've got different modes in the software that we can select as well which are on the right hand side so for example um, along the bottom here these buttons here we've obviously got to uh, configure so we can configure the software so basically we've got the uh, the input offset filters duty cycle meter range um, CCDF units etc and uh, you can configure those all that aspect to it um, then on top of that you've obviously got uh, measurement itself which is what we're looking at now where it reads forward and reflected power as a VSW average and uh, then on top of that on the right hand side down here we've got more um, selections that we can make um, which is from the top it's stop start type forward average we've got reflected average match um, so you can have a match there as well sensor configuration uh, you've got forward peak forward burst for pulse transmitters um, you've obviously got um, just click OK on that you've obviously got uh, I'm not sure what that is there what that does or oh, crest factor and CCDF as well not sure what they are those need to read up about that uh, but under forward average power there um, it'll change the mode on the sensor so then it supports that and then at the bottom again if we look back there <coughs> we've got uh, units as well so on the right hand side then we've got power under watts or dbm uh, we've got match um, we've got bswr return loss uh, rio uh, we've got um, efficiency in percentage and reflected in percentage as well so we've got all that capability there um, <clears throat> now it does work quite nicely and there are, there are quite a few other features as well where you can log things as well at the top here under log on the um, toolbar <clears throat> you can you can select enable data logging as well so that's quite good for when you're doing bench testing uh, conformance testing of transmitters or power amplifiers um, you can view it either in you know a small screen or full screen uh, you've got window view um, you've also got help menu as well so there's a user manual and then there's you know there's all that there as well um, so it is actually quite uh, quite good you can calibrate it there there's a calibration menu as well so there's, there's quite a bit there <clears throat> so if I if I key up again now this is obviously on FM and we're doing 15 watts and that's on a 100 watt scale and if I increase the RF power obviously uh, you know right up to you know we're talking 90 odd watts um, but the 50 ohm load that's connected to the end there this one gets quite hot <laughs> when that transceiver is transmitting at you know 100 watts or thereabouts so um, so yeah it's, it's quite it's quite an interesting piece of software you can do quite a bit with it um, obviously you've got all the miscellaneous and statistics in the box here as well so you can click on statistics as well and you can get all kinds of uh, power averages and things like that there so there's quite a bit that you can do with it um, 
So that's a, just a little rundown of the basics to start with. Okay, so we've got it on the SWR now, which is match. You've got match, VSWR, reflected average, reflected peak, all that. So we'll, we'll just keep up on the uh, radio now, and then we should start to see uh, a power reading. We've got, now we've got the graph now indicating VSWR, one on the left to one to one, one dot one, one or one dot one on the right. For this particular thing obviously that graph will change so if a needle goes off the scale for example to the right then the graph will update uh, the dial should I say and then it will obviously go up the scale automatically. Um, so we, we can see there on the left we've got 16 watts transmit, uh, we've got a VSWR reading in the middle which is giving you the VSWR of this 50 ohm load down there and then we've got the actual reflected power that the the dummy load isn't absorbing um, so that gives you an idea of that um, obviously on the right hand side here uh, we've got further selections that we can go into so there's um, we can get the mouse to appear which it's disappeared there we are. Uh, we've got uh, forward peak reflected average um, go down to it says units I think or amplitude this WR got return loss in DB uh, Rio and then efficiency as well what sort of efficiency so it'll be interesting to see how efficient that RF load is so it's nearly 100% efficient you see it absorbing the RF power um, so that gives us the efficiency uh, so you can get quite a lot of information, particularly you know when you're you're looking at um, reflected power, for example. So I'm transmitting again. So wait while it builds on the left, 16 watts, and uh, you're only getting 0.1, well 0.4, 0.58 roughly, 0.158ish percent power coming back. So, um, yeah, quite a bit. Quite a bit of info that you can tap into. Okay, so now we've got the uh, this bird meter <coughs> here on, which is the uh, bird model 61. And uh, this one only has a frequency range, by the way, 30 to 500 megahertz. You know, unfortunately, um, but still good for two meters and seventy-seven diameter radio band and all the commercial frequencies that lie between that range. Um, it can only handle though the watts on this, uh, fifteen and thirty watts, <coughs> which obviously when you when you look at the size of it, you know how large it is. I mean, it's absolutely enormous. Um, you know, so find it odd that that we've got such a big big dummy load on it oil filled and yet for that size and it can only handle 30 watts but there again <clears throat> it's probably designed for an application where it can take 30 watts continuous for weeks on end you know uh, continuously uh, without getting too hot and burning out so that's the difference the duty cycle rating on this is probably very high um, so yeah, we've got the transceiver set up on the 2 meter amateur band and when we key up into it, obviously we can select these little plugs you see go into the front here on this um, on these sockets, so when you plug these in it changes the power levels uh, as well obviously what you can measure, high or low power, that kind of thing um, so naturally with that out then, you know you can measure different power levels etc uh, it's got a nice little cover as well that protects the display so you know that just closes there you've got a zero set just here uh, and as we demonstrated earlier as well the fact that you can uh, remove the uh, meter unit itself and deploy it separately these are a bit of a pain in the backside to uh, to get in and out you know they, they do push in and out but they're still a pain um, and you to remove the, the front head obviously we've got a nice carry handle but to remove the front head you just flick these up these catches and then the head comes off 
at the front which then allows you obviously to uh, to use it uh, externally from the load um, but yeah it's quite an interesting uh, little meter I mean I've had this uh, some time but um, it's obviously designed as well for um, you know being thrown about put into vehicles taken out in case the glass gets protected obviously with this cover here it's very ruggedized and very well made I mean you know it's, it's nuclear bomb proof and obviously this is the rear of it um, it's got an oil filled load in it so yeah these are very good as well uh, sadly they're no good for HF use so any frequencies below 30 megahertz uh, but great for VHF and UHF use no problem there up to 30 watts um, two different scales obviously on it um, obviously the the top scale is the 30 watt scale and the lower scale is the 15 watt so quite a nice little meter not bad probably yeah I don't know when these were made probably a long time ago um, might have been in the 1960s something like that maybe 1970s but uh, still works today without a problem as you've seen um, a very good little unit indeed but um, there aren't that many of these about these they used to be at one time but I uh, don't see many of them about um, especially on the second hand market obviously the bird 43 has the edge on on this meter now that other meter I was talking about early in the video the telewave this is uh, this is the one uh, that I was gonna mention to you I just move that light out of the way uh, that's it there and I've had one of those well I've had a few of them actually and they've been very good but obviously you don't need with that the inserts you see and um, it does all the different frequency bands right from zero up to you know one gig or above but um, you get two different models of it one covers up to UHF and the other covers up to um, the full full frequency span up to a gig or whatever but I had one of those for donkey's years and it really good meter it measures forward and reflected power it's obviously got uh, 5 watts up to 500 watts measurement capability and you'll notice as well it's got a sniffer output just here a BNC sniffer output for a frequency counter or a mod meter to connect in there which is really good uh, and I had one of those for donkey's years um, sadly I, I sold it and I got rid of it but um, it's a lovely uh, lovely meter if ever you get one um, yeah but it's really weird is this meter here because I tend to find that the bigger the heat sinks the more RF it can take but that's only rated at 30 watts but interestingly this one uh, which is a what can this take then let's have a look at that one then see that can take 50 watts that's a model 8130 term bird term line um term line uh, load 50 watts and i just find that strange how you compare you compare the two in size that can take 50 watts continuous yeah it doesn't have any heat sinks on it you know it's just oil filled uh, and yet that that can only take 30 watts and it's the size of a house so i've no idea why that is but uh, looks to me like it's a very similar type arrangement but obviously not uh, well there you go it's just one of those things isn't it you know i mean when you compare it against this particular thing here this isn't a bird product by the way this one this is a another one that makes this can't remember who it was now who made this one but this is an rf attenuator uh this can take 150 watts and then obviously attenuate the signal down to give an output here um so technically it can still be used as an rf load obviously because it's dissipating that 150 watts down into a, a lesser output there but obviously then you can feed that off to test equipment and uh, meters etc which you'll see in other videos i've done but this uh is significantly smaller than that and that can take 150 watts that can take 50 watts and that can take 30 watts so i had wondered when they labeled this up whether they missed a zero off of 30 and it should be 300 watts but obviously not wishful thinking but it's a shame about that really because uh, for such a a giant size of uh, meter you know measuring uh, 15 30 watts it does seem a little bit odd that i must admit 
Anyway, um, I think that's about it, really. We've uh, we've covered all the uh, usual pods, what's inside them, the inserts that go in the Bird 43. We've had a look at the the Bird 43 itself meter, which is still king of the jungle, I think. It's fair to say when it when it comes to it, this meter is definitely the bee's knees when it comes to uh, RF power meters in the RF world. There are others, obviously, manufacturers that make RF power meters. I've had Roden Swartz as well, power meters. They're, they're quite good. Um, I've had a Telewave, as we've just shown on the website there, that I used to have one of those. Now, I'm not right sure if Telewave is part of Bird or was part of Bird or is part of Bird because they look remarkably the same. When you, if you were to compare, if you were to compare that against that, I mean, it's very similar indeed you know in design sort of shape you know it does seem a bit does seem a bit strange to me that but you've got these two meters that look very similar in the cabinet style the meter insert the lot you know all similar size the same kind of strap handle on the side you know i don't know it just just seems odd to me. I'll have to do some research perhaps and find out if Teleway is associated with Bird. It could well be, or it might be a copy, or maybe Bird copied Teleway. I have no idea. Maybe there's some uh, affiliation between them. I don't know. So anyway, at least we've had a look at the Bird 43, the 5000DX along with the 5016 uh, RF sensor. Uh, there, we've had a look at the inserts, the RF loads. Um, we've obviously looked at this meter as well, uh, which is the uh, the Bird um, Model 61 term line uh, watt meter in conjunction with the uh, multi mode multi band uh, radio transceiver the Yesu. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. We've obviously looked at the software as well uh, that runs on the um, uh, computer, which is a bit of a nightmare to install uh, if you ever get opportunity to get that uh, that software then by all means that's fine but uh, there's all sorts you know you can uh, you can do but um, with that um, I'll leave you to it and thanks very much for watching the video if you like the video please subscribe uh, give a thumbs up or um, leave your comments down below as usual um, of your experiences with bird equipment and bird through lines and um, I will catch up with you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching and take care. Bye-bye.